Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar about product management and innovation. Today, we're going to look at how product managers can innovate for the product by using the innovation funnel and how we can transform innovative ideas into concrete goals and products. I'll start with a quick intro of myself. So I'm Ekaterina, I'm a product manager growth for Prime Europe, and I bring several years of product management experience focused on building customer-facing features, improving the customer experience. I enjoy tapping into end-user needs to get inspired for new experiments and product features. So today I want to cover three main points, why innovation is a key element of the product management role and we should be thinking about it constantly, how we can manage the innovation process by channeling it into a funnel, and how we can turn our ideas into concrete products and shaping them into smart goals. So we often think about something radical when talking about innovation. In fact, innovation is about coming up with new and better ways of doing something. So it could be a new feature, which is part of the product roadmap, like a new mobile feature or a UX redesign, or a new way of presenting something. For example, developing a process to automate and save manual effort required to perform a task. By nature, product managers are constantly curious. They always ask themselves, how can I make a product better? How this can serve better the end customers? How can I bring more value to it? On the other side, innovation extends the product life cycle. In fact, if we look at Fortune 500 lists, featuring 500 biggest companies by annual revenue, only 52 companies stayed on the list since its inception in 1955. This raised the importance of how bringing constant product innovation is important to keep the product life and then also make the whole business work. So innovation and product managers have the same goal. They both target the end user and they're meant to bring value to them. Innovation usually starts with an idea. Ideas can be many, so we need to find a way to categorize them and start uh, understanding which ones are more, more moving forward. So in order to configureize them, we can adopt a matrix uh, called innovation matrix, uh, which is based on two key inputs. Uh, are we implementing a new or an existing technology? And are we addressing a new or an existing market? Most radical innovations uh, are both using a new technology and opening a new market. We can think, for example, about uh, crypto industry or 3D paint printers. On the opposite side, uh, we have architectural innovations. They leverage existing technology to take them to another field. We can think about the Uber case. Ride sharing, geolocation, and freelance worker um, were already existing and were in fact nothing new. But combined, however, they became a game-changing innovation that served as standout example uh, of the sharing economy, which right now is also sometimes called the Uberification. Disruptive innovation happens uh, when a new market is created or we change the way consumer usually interact with it. We can think, for example, about the streaming services, but also about the Apple uh, iPod. So the first iPod was uh, um, released in 2001, and it was basically offering, a, it was a portable media player that could hold an average of uh, roughly 1,000 songs. It's so the iPod was not uh, an attempt by Apple to make a disruptive innovation. Already similar uh, media players were existing, although the iPod was considered a better product than the majority of them. Instead, Apple's first example of destructive innovation was a combination of the iPod and the simultaneous release of the iTunes. So the iTunes Store, which was like a, a music marketplace combined with the iPod uh, being a media li library which allowed uh, instant access to music, uh, locked iPod users into a purchasing music uh, into purchasing music from iTunes Store. But most importantly, it offered convenience uh, uh, in terms of price uh, for the end users. Lastly, we have the incremental innovation, and I think they're the most common for product features. Uh, and relevant for product managers. They describe a series of gradual improvements, which then result in large-scale organizational changes. This is also the most accessible form of innovation, as it often can be performed without requiring huge budget investments, and it can be also leaner into the decision-making process. So let's see how actually we can manage innovative ideas and bring them to life by leveraging the innovation funnel. 
So Innovation Funnel for Product Management is made of four main steps. It all starts with ideation, where we can unleash our creativity and bring as many ideas as we want. Actually, the more the better. But of course, we need to find a way to prioritize them. So that's why we filter and prioritize ideas by assessing their feasibility and possible impact. The most promising ones are then being uh, uh, built uh, and tested. Uh, so then we can scale best performance while getting learning from the remaining ones. This all actually is meant to drive continuous innovation for the product so that it's not just a one-off ideation which like you're driving once a year or maybe twice a year, but you're thinking, continuously thinking what else can be done and then also input this into the product roadmap. So it all starts with ideas. There are several ways to generate ideas. We can look at trends, we can look at quantitative analysis, we can look at qualitative analysis, uh, user anecdotes and surveys. So there are many ways to tackle ideation. So how, where we can start from? One way to develop products, uh, which will actually will bring value to the end customer is to start uh, from the customer needs and work backwards from them. To deeply understand user needs, uh, we can ask questions, collect feedback uh, into a centralized repository, which is then consulted uh, from uh, for ideation session. Or sometimes also we can just put ourselves into the customer shoes. What will a product uh, make a product easier to use? What problem is my idea solving? What could make myself happy about this product? As an example, Amazon Go was trying to address the customer problem to wait in line at checkout and trying to uh, find an automated way to skip the line and uh, uh, make the checkout process faster. Developing a product with customer in mind also reduces time to market and the cost of experimentation. In fact, it will also help to reduce the risk of failure while not being limited by competitors or trends, which might be temporary. So you don't want to build a product which is just based as something which is one off and will not be scalable in the future. Once we get an idea, the next step is actually to assess ideas feasibility, both in terms of impact, purpose, and resources required. This will help us moving forward towards the building phase. So which of the many ideas we have in mind, we should be prioritized on our roadmap. One way to assess ideas perspective is to leverage a framework, framework which will clearly explain how the customer will benefit from your idea if this will be launched. At Amazon, for example, we leverage the uh, press uh, PR FAQ, which is a standardized framework uh, um, um, in a format of a six page document made of three key sections. There is a customer facing PR. There is a series of internal frequently answered questions, which we ask ourselves and which well, which are meant to cover the CX from end to end. Uh, let's go quickly one by one. So the PR, the press release part. The press release part needs to be uh, very crisp. It's actually supposed to be no longer than one page. And it presents the idea as if it was launched and it was covered by the press. The goal here is to provide a retrospective of your idea from an external point of view. So just imagine if your idea tomorrow was launched. So how this should be issued on the press? How do you think will be perceived externally? The FAQ part is meant of two sections. We have internal FAQs and external FAQs. Both are meant to cover um, the, to understand the purpose of the idea you're driving. External FAQs address questions that customer and other external stakeholders might be asking. So we range from questions like, for example, how will I learn about this feature? Uh, how, it, what is the value added? How will it be better from, if compared to what I'm currently using? Internal FAQs are actually addressing questions that internal stakeholders might ask. And those questions are actually meant to cover the process um, following the following the building, building side. For example, they may ask which resources are required to launch this? How we measure the success? But when we want to launch this? We can use simple language when putting an idea in writing. This will help also ourselves uh, to make the feasibility assessment easier to understand uh, and easier for us uh, and for the stakeholders involved uh, while bringing clarity on the end goal purpose. As product managers, uh, 
um, I think that we are deeply involved uh, in the product uh, we are managing. So I think we should not only be relying on the data, but also on the personal instinct of a product. So beside the data, we can make an effective way to craft the idea um, and once again support you in the feasibility analysis space. In a nutshell, when turning an idea into a possible product uh, and convincing actually your stakeholder that an idea should be implemented and turned into a product, uh, we can follow the approach of setting up a smart goal. So what does the smart framework mean? It means that uh, the idea you're driving should be uh, pursuing a, a specific goal. So this will make us go into detail on why and what the idea will achieve and how we'll reach it. For example, we want to say that this idea will increase the number of global subscribers. This may be accomplishing by adding, by adding this feature or performing a certain, say, refresh. Every idea needs to be measurable. So quantify the goal. Make sure that this is measurable because this will also make easier to track the progress and understand when you're reaching the finish line. That's why we say if we progress further with the example, I want to, my, my idea will drive a uh, we drive membership growth by X percent. As we're in the phase when we're just setting the idea, we also want to ask ourselves if this idea is achievable. So is um, your objective something your team can reasonably accomplish? It? Do we have the resources for it? Safeguarding the achievability of a product is much easier when you're in the, the one setting it and you're still in an early phase. Every goal needs to be relevant. So here's when you need to take a step back and think about the big picture. Why are you proposing to drive forward this idea? Why are you setting this goal? And finally, we also need to have some time, say time frames. So we need to give ourselves some timelines by when we want to develop, when we want to launch a minimum viable product, how we want to measure it, and what is the um, roadmap look like. Once an SD idea has been assessed and received the green light for building, we can start building and testing the idea we've been working on so far. There are several projects uh, um, and, uh, and approaches uh, based on the product itself. So I won't go right now in the building part details as it can be I mean, an automation process, it can be a customer facing feature, which requires working with the designers and UX. So there are some general concepts which can um, be applied to the product building phase. The first one is to try to adopt an agile working model, to have a small team that is responsible for the product from end to end. This will give you also the full ownership of the end result. It will minimize bureaucracy and accelerate the decision-making process so that you will also feel empowered to try this forward and be accountable for both the product success or learn from its failures. A single trade owner should have all resources to deliver, measure, and being able to react. A second point to keep in mind when testing with new product launches uh, is to factor in the possibility of failure, which also means uh, that uh, it's not like something didn't work and it ended there. It means that we're collecting learnings uh, how for new products uh, and how our future iteration will help us to craft a product uh, uh, working successfully based on the learnings we collected so far. Incremental innovation requires speed to test multiple experiences and find the best performing features to be scaled. Especially when talking about granular, gradual innovations, many decisions are reversible. The so-called two-way doors decision. An example could be a mobile feature or a UX design. While one-way door decision requires heavily planning and also capital, a capital intense, two-way doors are reversible. They can be quickly made and they can be tested with linear decision-making process. In fact, it's also interesting to know that consumers typically adopt and purchase slightly upgraded products than completely new one revolutionizing. For example, we can think about the Apple and the iPhone case. Every year, Apple makes small but significant changes to the iPhone in order to improve it. Over the years, innovations have included new cameras, touch ID, a personal assistant and multi-touch interface. Many of these innovations now feel like they're common, but this is because actually Apple led the way and others were to follow. So 
In a nice nutshell, driving continuous innovation for a product, it's part of an every product manager as we're responsible for the success of the products. We're responsible for the fact that this should bring greater to the customers. And in the end, it's also a way to extend the product life cycle by bringing value to end users. There are some general rules which can help to keep uh, uh, being, uh, keep innovating for your customer. Again, not just a one off, but constantly. So we can get inspired by putting the customer first, inventing on their behalf, understanding what they're saying, what can easily make their life uh, uh, easier when you, when they're leveraging the product you are managing. We can use also mechanisms to track the progress. So we're building tools or we're launching features, we drive adoption and we expect the outcome. Finally, we can foster the adoption of a culture that will empower innovation, not just for yourself and the product you're managing, but throughout the whole organization. Basically, discuss uh, being uh, uh, open to discuss new ideas, understand the potential, scaling success, and also learning from failures. So understand really how the innovation part uh, can be not just restricted to yourself and your products, but uh, something which everyone is responsible for. I hope you enjoyed this session and uh, I hope that this will also help to drive slightly more innovation for the products you're managing. Thank you very much for attending and should you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn and happy to follow up on this. Thank you very much.